Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we are going to be looking just at one chapter, John chapter 1. And so let's talk about briefly just an overview of this whole chapter, and then we'll do all the details. So the beginning part, and and different people parse this differently. Some say it's the first 18 verses. Some say it's the first 14. But the the very beginning of John chapter 1 is basically talking about in the beginning was the Word. And it's almost like it's a hymn to Jesus. Many scholars look at the first 14 or 18 verses as a hymn to Jesus. In fact, one scholar said that the first 14 verses is the theme for the whole book of John. And I think that argument can be made. We'll look at some of that as we go through this. In verse 15 to verse 28 of John chapter 1, John the Baptist bears witness of Jesus at Bethabara, the house of crossing. And that's where he's baptizing. And that's where the Jordan River dumps into the Dead Sea. And then in verses 19 through 28, John the Baptist interacts with questioning priests and Levites that are coming. And they're not asking questions to really learn, are they, Bryce? No. (laughs) They're not there to be his friend. Trap and trick and... And it, it, it's the Ezra early on. Yeah, this is the antidikos or the adversary or the diabolos, the person that's throwing things at you, and they're throwing these accusations. And so John's being a little bit careful in his answering of the priests and Levites or these messengers that come from Jerusalem. And then in verses 29 through 34, Jesus comes to John to be baptized. And we read where John says, Behold the Lamb of God. In verses 35 through 42, we read this story where Andrew and Simon say, we have found the Messiah. And they ask a question. They say to Jesus, where do you dwell? And we get this invitation. We'll talk about that as we go through this. And then finally, at the end of John chapter 1, Jesus speaks with two individuals, Philip and Nathaniel. And the end of John chapter 1, we read this. He saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And what's interesting is that word for you in the Greek is humin, which is plural. And so I want to just submit that this entire chapter is a message to all of us. In the text, yes, Jesus is talking to Nathaniel, but he's really talking to you. You are Nathaniel. So if you read this story of John chapter 1 and we try to put ourselves in it, I think it will have more meaning for us. And so that's a breakdown of the chapter. One more thing we need to point out, that the first 34 verses of John 1 are changed by Joseph Smith in the Joseph Smith translation. That's a huge chunk. So make sure you go to your appendix and compare them side by side, because there are some beautiful little additions that Joseph throws in to the first 34 verses of John. Yeah, I really think one of the things Joseph Smith is working to teach us is that John the Baptist isn't a stranger to Jesus, because we read in verse 31 and 33 that John's saying that he didn't know Jesus. And, you know, there's a lot of people wondering, how can you not know Jesus? You're John, and you're calling him the Lamb of God. And so that's fixed in the Joseph Smith translation. In essence, John knows who Jesus is. I think the Joseph Smith translation also really tries to help us understand the context of verse 18, that no man hath seen God at any time. Well, clearly John has, because he's calling him the Lamb of God. The disciples see him at the transfiguration, and we put some of this stuff in the show notes for you where modern-day prophets have talked about all the examples of people who have seen God. And so that's kind of ironed out in the Joseph Smith translation. Now, allow us to take a minute with John before we actually get into John chapter 1, because John is a different gospel writer. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. Synoptic meaning similar. And if you look at your 
Bible chronology, you'll see that they're very similar. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are talking about the same ideas. And you'll notice that John's verses usually don't have a corollary verse in Matthew, Mark, and Luke when you look at that harmony. Because John is kind of different. Now, we suspect that Mark wrote first, probably under the direction of Peter, to get a record down. Let's get this recorded. Matthew kind of picks that up, but he has a different audience in mind. Matthew seems to be trying to convince the Jews that they missed the Messiah. Matthew's the one that's always pointing out the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He's always saying, oh, Jesus did this, and that's a fulfillment of this Old Testament prophecy, because Matthew's trying to convince the Jews. He's writing to the Jews. Luke is writing to a very intelligent friend of his by the name of Theophilus that kind of represents the Gentile audience, the, you weren't here, you didn't experience this, and so let me tell it to you as if you are an outsider, kind of a stranger. So Luke's account is a little bit more, let me give you a lot of detail to explain it. And those are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels. Now, John, we believe— is writing to the members, the Christians, the ones who were familiar with Jesus, who lived with him. But John seems to be thinking that we missed him, that they missed him, that they didn't quite comprehend all that he was. And John's book is an attempt to say, wait a minute, let's go back, re-examine some of these events that I think were bigger than we realized they were at the time. And he's emphasizing a lot of things that Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't emphasize, and John writes that way. Let me give you a couple of examples. In John chapter 4, we have the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. Now watch what Jesus becomes. Starting in verse 9, she calls him a Jew, and she probably does it with a lot of disdain in her voice. How is it that thou, being a Jew, that's what Jesus was, is he was just a Jew. A few verses later in verse 11, it's a little bit more respectful, and now it's, sir, sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. And then, after the conversation continues, verse 19, she says, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And then she runs into town at his invitation to invite the people out, and she says to them, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Do you see that progression? Now, that's symbolic of what John's trying to do in his whole book. He's trying to take Jesus from what they thought he was and pull back the curtain so that they see who he really is. He went from a Jew to sir to a prophet to Christ. Now, another example, John chapter 9. This is the man born blind. This is another example of exactly what John is trying to do. Jesus starts in verse 11. The man says, a man that is called Jesus. That's all the Savior was to him at the beginning. A man that is called Jesus. And then later on, verse 17, what sayest thou of him that opened thine eyes? He is a prophet. Then there's this little dialogue with the Pharisees where he says to them, will you also be his disciples? Now, I think it's pretty obvious what he meant because in the next verse, they reviled him and said, thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. I think he was basically saying, I have become his disciple. And in the vernacular of the time, he would be calling him master. And then he gets kicked out, and the Lord finds him, and he says, Jesus says, dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus says, thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. So you see the idea, the progression went from a man called Jesus to a prophet, to my master, to my God, my Lord. And he worshiped him. 
Now, those are examples of what John's trying to do in his whole book. He's trying to say, wait a minute, I think we missed him. Let's go back and see him big picture. So that's why the very end of John chapter 1 is very symbolic. When John the Baptist's disciples turn from John the Baptist and start following Jesus, the Savior asks the question in verse 38, what seek ye? And they say, we want to know where you dwell. And then Jesus utters three words which I believe are the theme of John's whole book. Come and see. I think he's inviting people who don't know Jesus to come and see, but he's inviting the people who knew him to come back and see bigger. Open your eyes and see more than you've ever seen. Come and see. Now watch how that theme continues. I think it needs to be inserted in verse 41, so allow me to insert it. One of the two was Andrew, Simon's brother. So... Andrew finds Simon Peter and says, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Now, I think those three words are implied right there. Andrew said to Peter, we have found the Messiah. Come and see. It happens again. Philip finds Nathanael and says in verse 54, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathanael says, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip repeats those three words, come and see. That's what John's whole book is trying to do. So this year, as we study the Gospels, Pay attention to what John is doing that's different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are trying to say, here's what he did. Let's fall in love with him through his actions and his words and his miracles. And then John's stepping in to say, okay, now that you've fallen in love with him, let's pull the curtain pack and see big picture who this man is. Now, let me point out that Mark begins at his ministry. Mark begins at his baptism. Now, Matthew and Luke pull back a little bit and say, wait a minute, we need to go back to his birth. So, Matthew and Luke start at the birth of Christ. But John does not start there, because John is saying, wait a minute, come back and see this man is much bigger than his birth. Look where John begins. John takes us back to pre-mortal life to point out who and what Jesus was in the very beginning. Yeah. And so with that, let's go to the very beginning of the book of John. I just love to say this. I, I love the way it reads. It's the Greek, en arche en hologos, kai hologos en proston theon, kai theos en hologos. In English, in the beginning was the word, the logos, and the word was Prostontheon, the Word, the Logos, was with God, and the Word was God, Kaitheos and Hologos. The Word was God. This verse opens up so many possibilities. John is, he's really teaching us a lot of things. One of the things is that Jesus is the Word or the Logos, and I'll just say this, we put a lot of stuff in the show notes on the Logos because the early Christians and the Greeks really wrestled with this idea of what is the Logos. And some of the early Greeks really looked at the Logos as eternal reason. It was this expression of their conviction of the overall rationality of the universe. The Greeks, many of them, did not think of the Logos as something personal, and so they didn't understand it as we would God, but for them it was like this force of rationality that existed everywhere, and it was a principle that was the supreme principle of the universe. What we see John doing is he's taking this expression and he's making it personal, and he's saying that the Logos, or the reason, what we're going to call in English the Word, was God. And I really like this explanation by President Nelson. President Nelson gave a talk called Jesus Christ, Our Master and More. And he said this about the Logos. He says, in the Greek language of the New Testament, that word was Logos, and it meant expression. It was another name for the Master. That terminology may seem strange to us, but it is appropriate. 
we use words to convey our expression to others. So Jesus was the word or the expression of his father to the world. And so in the beginning was the expression or the word, the expression of who God the father is. How do I know what God the father is like? Look at Jesus. And if you look to Jesus, then you've seen the Father. And so that's beautiful stuff. Now, I, I want to just say in Arche, in Hologos, this idea of Arche means it's chief or first. Um, it, it can mean a lot of things. Sometimes Joseph Smith says that he expresses this idea in the premortal councils. In the beginning was the council of the gods. That's another way to look at this. John is evoking the image of Genesis 1. The first few verses in John chapter 1 are really evoking that image. In fact, it's really the first five verses. So look at these verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, Zoe, and the life was the Phos, the light of men, and the light shines in the scotia, in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. So what do we have here? We have images of the creation. We have Arche, which is the beginning. We have the Logos. We have this idea of creating things. And then we have the word for life, Zoe, and we have the word for darkness. And those are all the images that we read in the creation narrative. Now, if you remember, especially if you've listened to the Old Testament podcast, the Genesis story of Genesis 1 and 2 was taught at the temple anciently. All biblical scholars are acknowledging this, that the story of the creation was told annually at the temple to evoke in the listeners the idea of getting our bearings, knowing who God is and our place in the universe, in the cosmos. And if we understand the first, then we know where we are. In the words of Joseph Smith, if you start right, you can finish right. And Joseph used that in the context of, we need to know who God is. If we know that we have a God and he is our father and we understand that he is a man, then we're starting right and know where we're to go. So John is opening up our minds to consider Jesus in the pre-mortal councils. He was proston theon. He was next to his father. There's a beautiful image by Robert Barrett where he paints the pre-earth council and he has the son standing next to the father. That is the image in my mind of proston theon. You might be interested in reading in the King Follett discourse at the end of Joseph Smith's life. He kind of says that same thing. He says, if men do not comprehend the character of God, they do not comprehend themselves. He begins that King Follett discourse with, we've got to get the beginning right. We've got to start right. And the start right is to understand who God is. Because if we can comprehend who God is, we can comprehend who we are. Joseph continues in that speech, it is necessary we should understand the character and being of God and how he came to be so, for I am going to tell you how God came to be God. And then he continues, it is the first principle of the gospel to know for a certainty the character of God and to know that we may converse with him as one man converses with another. Joseph is basically saying in the King Follett discourse exactly what John is trying to do here. We've got to go back and get our bearings right. We've got to start right. And that is God and our relationship to him. We have a heavenly father. We have a heavenly mother. There was a redeemer chosen in premortal life. The plan is in effect. If we understand that and our connection to them, then everything else will go right. So John starts in premortal existence. We have to understand our heavenly father, his purposes in sending his son, and our relationship to both of them. Beautiful. I, I really like and appreciate Joseph Smith's commentary in the King Fault Discourse and see it sitting right in this tradition. I will say that if we look at this text mythically as taking place in the temple, it will open our minds to new possibilities. Now, I understand that we're having this take place at Bethabara, which is this dry area where the River Jordan is dumping into the Dead Sea, and it's probably hot, and it's probably desolate, 
And that's the image. It's the backwater of Palestine. But if we read this mythically as taking place in the temple, which I think John's doing, and I think he's doing it purposefully, we have other images come to mind. Now, John here is going to be a witness. We read this starting in John chapter 1, verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, that's John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. Now, that word belief that that word is pistis generally it's conjugated different ways but that idea it can be trust uh sometimes it's translated as faith that word belief is more than just like oh i believe it might snow tomorrow no that's a trust something that we put our trust into i think is probably another way to say this but that word belief is what's going on in verse 7 that pistis that really deep and abiding trust he was not that light meaning John was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now you might want to go and read DNC 93, starting about verse 2 to verse 10, to read more into that, that the light is in all men that come into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, Aistaidia, his own people. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now that word for received, in the Greek it has this lab stem, and that lab stem really is to take by the hand. The image I want you to have on that word receive is to take him by the hand. Probably a really good image is the individuals that are going to the tree of life in 1 Nephi 8. They're holding on to the rod of iron. That's the image that I want to put in your mind when John uses that phrase, as many as received him. Now, this idea of having power to become the sons of God is different than all of us being children of God. Having power to become the sons of God is that we become sons and daughters of Christ through covenant. King Benjamin lays this out in Mosiah 5 verse 7, where he says, Because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he has spiritually begotten you, For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore, ye are born of him and have become his sons and his daughters. That is the invitation in verse 12, that we receive him, think of clinging to the rod of iron, and we become his sons and his daughters, sons of Christ, which were born, verse 13, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word, the logos, was made flesh and dwelt among us. Kai hologos sarx eganeto kai eskenosen. That word, eskenosen, that is evoking the image of the tabernacle. Literally, it says that he tented or tabernacled among men. John is doing this purposefully. He's using this word to hearken our minds back to the Exodus and God coming into the holy tent of meaning. This is important. John is using temple imagery, and he's doing it purposefully. And so, in this instance, this is the Logos who is becoming Sarks. He is becoming flesh. In other words, I like to teach this, that Jesus, who is the Son of God, is also like one of us. In every respect, he is human, and he has the veil. He has to pray. He has to learn how to read. He has to do all those things that we talked about in the last podcast about growing. But here he is, full grown. He knows who he is, but he's still completely mortal. He's with us. Now, before we move on, Mike, let's just talk a little bit about an application here that John was sent into the world to be a witness of the light. He wasn't the light but was sent to bear witness of the light. I am grateful that John presents this at the very beginning of his record, because quite often we get caught up in being the light ourselves. Nephi will talk about priestcrafts, and priestcrafts are when we set ourselves up as the light. And John is making it very clear that we are the witnesses, that everything we do is to draw attention to that light 
which is the true light, which enlighteth every one who cometh into the world, even the Son of God. I need to remember that my job is servant. My job is witness. My job is to draw attention to him. Sometimes we get in the way and we become the light. Elder Bednar said it this way, we must be careful to remember in our service that we are conduits and channels. We are not the light. It is never about me and it is never about you. In fact, anything you or I do as an instructor that knowingly and intentionally draws attention to self in the message we present and the methods we use or in our personal demeanor is a form of priestcraft that inhibits the teaching effectiveness of the Holy Ghost. I love that this is how John begins is that John and all of the rest of us are sent and we need to make sure I stay in my lane and that I witness of his light, but I don't become the light. And while we're here, let's just once again emphasize, don't let a podcast replace just reading the text. The text is really where it's at. I mean, Bryce and I are really excited about the text. We're excited to do this podcast, but at the same time, we want to make sure to emphasize that idea that, boy, read John 1. This is good. Okay, so with that, John bears witness of him, and... This is where he says in verse 15, this was he of whom I spake that he cometh after me is preferred before me for he was sent before me and of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now that reference to Moses, we will make note of that again later because I think John is doing this purposefully. But what he's doing here is he's standing as a witness, and then he says in verse 18, and this can be difficult, where he says, no man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Joseph Smith changes that to read, no man has seen God at any time, except he has borne record of the Son, for except it is through him, no man can be saved. Major change. And so that's fixed in the Joseph Smith translation. In essence, John knows who Jesus is. I think that is significant. And I think that really, and we'll get back to this, I think in one setting or in one instance, verse 18 can make sense in a liturgical context. But like we mentioned earlier in the podcast, I think that verse 18, as well as verse 31 and 33, can be some of the more difficult bits of John 1 in an otherwise beautiful narrative. And so then then we shift. If you go to verse 19, we shift because there's individuals that come from Jerusalem. It says that the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem, and they're going to question John, and they're not his friends. And they're trying to pin down, okay, what are you doing here? Uh, What's your message? And they ask him, who are you? And he says, I'm not the Christ. And then they say, are you Elias? And then he says, I am not. And then they say, who are you that we may give an answer? And his response is really interesting. In one sense, he is an Elias or a preparer. Uh, And by the way, just as a side note, Elias is the Greek rendering of Elijah. But I think there can be other meanings here. But look what he says. He says in verse 23, when he tells them who he is, he says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah or Isaiah. And so that's his answer. And it's kind of enigmatic to them. I don't think they get it. But this is my reading of this. I think he's telling them, yeah, I'm Elias, and I'm going to tell you I am, and you're not going to get it because you guys are dodo heads. Uh, He is the one that's crying in the wilderness saying, make straight the way of the Lord. He is the preparatory one preparing people whose hearts are ready to receive Jesus. I think that anyone who prepares people for the Lord is an Elias in that way. Wouldn't you say, Bryce? Yes. But there are some that are identified as very significant Eliases. Like, I am an Elias in the sense that I went on a mission and prepared people for Jesus and for covenants. But we've identified some landmark Eliases that are going to do some wonderful things. Now, if you read this whole episode in the Joseph Smith translation, it really opens our eyes and might actually point to a reference of Joseph Smith. It is my testimony 
that John knew of the great restorer that was to come in the latter days. Now, if you listen to our podcast in the Old Testament, how many times did Mike and I point out that Old Testament prophets were talking about a great restoration in the latter days? Even Peter in Acts chapter 3 will talk about a restoration of all things as a future event, not as a, oh, Jesus did it. So I'm going to read this conversation as it appears in the Joseph Smith translation. When these people come out and ask John, who art thou? He confessed and denied not that he was Elias. That's a very different rendering. He denied not that he was Elias, but confessed, saying, I am not the Christ. Now listen to how this next question reads. And they asked him, saying, How then art thou Elias? And he said, I am not that Elias who was to restore all things. There it is. There it is. And they asked him again, Art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. He's being very clear. He is an Elias, but he is not that Elias. He's not the Elias that's going to restore all things. Now, they ask another question that's intriguing. After they ask, who are you? And he says, I'm one crying in the wilderness. Then they asked him and said unto him, why baptizest thou if thou be not the Christ? nor Elias who shall restore all things, neither that prophet. In other words, how are you baptizing if you're not the Elias that's going to restore all things? So they're talking about a tradition of an Elias that would restore all things and would have authority, keys from God. I believe this is a very clear reference to Joseph Smith that John was saying, I'm not the Messiah. He's the one I'm preparing you for. I am an Elias, but I'm not the great Elias that will restore all things. That is the seer of the latter days that Joseph of Egypt said would come. I think he's pointing our attention to our day and the restoration of all things in our day and was speaking of Joseph Smith. I think if we really read John, we have to connect not just who was God in the beginning, but where is God going in the end, and that there will be a restoration. If we understand that, then we can understand the mission of Jesus on earth. And so we boldly proclaim to the world that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints is, in fact, that restoration. Awesome. Powerful message. Now go to verse 31. And I knew him not. Now Joseph Smith is going to amend that in the JST. Let's continue. But that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. And so John's reasoning for why he's baptizing is that Christ should be made manifest. Thanarun, that word manifest in the Greek, is to be made revealed. This is a word that is characteristic of John's writings. You might want to look at these verses. We just covered John 131, but it comes up again in John 211, John 321, John 74, John 93, John 176, John 21, 1, and verse 14 in John 21. This is a big deal to John. To John, those that receive him, think of the rod of iron, those that receive him and those that believe in him or trust in him, to them will he be made manifest. If you, we think about this in a temple setting, at least in the context of Nephi's vision, they hold the rod, they proceed forth, meaning they trust him, and then what happens? They're now at the foot of the tree, and they behold the Lamb of God. He is made manifest. This is a common theme throughout John's record. And then go down to verse 32. John bear record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And then we read that he bear record in verse 34 that this is the Son of God, and then we read in verse 35, this is where we read of Andrew and Simon Peter following Jesus. 
The next day after John stood and two of the disciples, looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following, and he said, What do you want, or what do you seek? And they said unto him, Rabbi, where do you dwell? Now that's a different word for dwell. They're asking, Didaskele uh, pumenes. They're saying, Teacher, where are you temporarily, or where are you menes, is that mene stem is like, where are you remaining, or where are you kind of resting right now? And he says in verse 39, come and see. And then it says, they abode with him that day, for it was the 10th hour. One of the two which heard John speak followed him, and that was Andrew, Simon's brother. He finds his brother Simon, which is going to be Peter, and he said unto him, we have found the Messiah. And then when he's brought to Jesus, we read Jesus calling him Kephas, which by interpretation is a stone. He's going to be called Peter. And so then the next day in verse 43, we're introduced to a couple other characters, Philip and Nathaniel. And Philip comes to Nathaniel and he says, we have found the person that Moses wrote about. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, he calls him. And he says, we found him. And Nathanael says, well, where did you find him? And he says, we found him in Nazareth. And then Nathanael responds, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And I love the response. Philip says, come and see. And so when Nathanael meets Jesus, Jesus has this really interesting interchange where he says in verse 47, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. And Nathanael responds, how do you know me? And Jesus says, well, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, it's interesting to read this verse because in John 1, 48, the Greek translation, at least my translation, is going to read something like this. Being under the fig, Nathaniel, I knew you. Or it could be translated like this. When you were under the fig tree, Nathaniel, I saw you, I understood you, and I regarded you. Now I'm embellishing the use of adon here. Adon is the aorist or the Finnish action of the Greek verb ado, which means to see or perceive or know or to discern. So that bit in there where he says, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you in verse 48, it can mean see, but it can also mean like I knew you or I perceived you. And that's kind of how I'm going to read this. I'm going to read it as a more intimate knowing or seeing. And so because of this, he responds and he says, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. So we have all these titles all through John. We have the logos, the lamb of God, the son of God, the king of Israel, so many titles. But then Jesus responds in verse 50, He says, because I said unto you, I saw you under the fig tree. Now, this is not a question in the Greek. It reads as a question in the King James. So I'm going to read it as a question in the King James, but I'm going to read it then in, in the Greek. He says, because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. That's the King James. But the Greek is not a question. It reads like this. Jesus answered and said, because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, you believe, you are going to see greater things than these. That's pretty cool. In other words, guess what, Nathaniel? You got more coming. You're going to see more things. And then notice what he says. He said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the heavens open. Now that ye is human, that's plural. It's Jesus talking to us. You shall see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Note that Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. All the titles throughout John 1 that everyone else is giving to him are true. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Logos. He is the light of men. He is the Son of God. He is the King of Israel. But Jesus calls himself the son of man. Now that ties us into the apocalyptic texts and writings of Daniel. If you're interested, go back and listen to this stuff that we did on Daniel or read the book of Daniel. I would encourage you to do that as well. We also put some really good things in the show notes about the son of man texts. To be brief in speaking, the son of man is the cosmic king that's going to fix everything. 
and Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. I also like that title because, and this is in the words of Joseph Smith, God the Father is a man of holiness, and Jesus is the Son of Man. He is a man in every respect, and his Father is a man, and Jesus is showing us how to become people of holiness, to become, verse 12, the sons and daughters of Christ. That is the overarching message. And because Nathaniel believes, Jesus says in verse 50, as a statement, because you believe, you will see greater things. And you will, and by the way, that image in verse 51, you shall see the heavens open and angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. In essence, that's evoking the image back in Genesis, where Jacob has a vision of the ladder to heaven. And the ladder is Jesus. He is the ladder. Angels are ascending and descending on him. And so the way I kind of package verse 51, the way I try to read it is Jesus is the ladder to get us to heaven. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So that's a beautiful image right there in verse 51 that is once again a temple image opening the veil and inviting us to do a couple of things. To receive him, think of holding the rod of iron. To believe him, Think of trusting in him. And as we do this, things will be made manifest. And we, that's verse 51, we will see the heavens open. It's really cool. I love it. It's good stuff. So let me give you Frederick Farrar's edition of that. Nathaniel, come and see, can any good come out of Nazareth? I love this. Frederick Farrar wrote, Today, too, that question, can any good thing come out of Nazareth, is often repeated, and the one sufficient answer, almost the only possible answer, is now as it then was, come and see. Then it meant, come and see one who speaks as never man spake. Come and see one who, though he be but a carpenter of Nazareth, yet overawes the souls of all who approach him, seeming by his mere presence to reveal the secrets of all hearts, yet drawing to him even the most sinful with a sense of yearning love. Come and see one from whom there seems to breathe forth the irresistible charm of a sinless purity." the unapproachable beauty of a divine life. Come and see, said Philip, convinced in his simple, faithful heart that to see Jesus was to know him, and to know was to love, and to love was to adore. In this sense, indeed, we can say, come and see no longer, for his earthly form has been visible no more. But there is another sense, no less powerful for conviction, in which it still suffices to say, in answer to all doubts, come and see. Come and see a dying world revivified, a decrepit world regenerated, an aged world rejuvenescent. Come and see the darkness illuminated, the despair dispelled. Come and see tenderness brought into the cell of the imprisoned felon and liberty to the fettered slave. Come and see the dens of lust and tyranny transformed into sweet and happy homes, defiant atheists into believing Christians, rebels into children, and pagans into saints. And as you see them all, it may be that you too will unlearn the misery of doubt and exclaim in calm and happy confidence with the pure and candid Nathaniel, Rabbi, Thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. I love that. Come and see. Okay, so to me, John 1, really, there's really three pieces we got to look at when we read Scripture. We got to read the text, but then we also have to have revelations of the restoration, prophets and things Joseph taught. And then the third thing is the unspoken stuff in the temple. And if we look at all three of these things together— They shed light on each other, and they help us in our quest to follow Jesus. Now, John is using temple imagery. Hopefully, you've seen that by now. You've seen that throughout. So we're going to try to explain this in a way that's going to evoke the first Israelite temple and an ascent. So go to the first slide where it talks about the tabernacle. And what we have, for those of you that don't have the slide, just just imagine in your mind you have the tabernacle where you have the Debir, or the Holy of Holies. The Debir is the place of speaking where the Ark of the Covenant was. 
The room before that is the Hakal, or the holy place. On the right is the table of shewbread. On the left is the candlestick of the menorah. And in the front is the altar of incense. And then it's right in front of the veil. John the Revelator says that the prayers of the righteous is that altar of incense, that smoke that rises up from the altar is the prayer of the saints that opens the veil. Think about how that fits liturgically. And then outside of the Hakal is the laver and the altar of sacrifice and what's called the ulam. That is the tabernacle. And so the first five verses in John are evoking creation imagery. We have arche for beginning, logos for word, we have the Word was with God, prostontheon. So what do we have? We have two gods. We have the Word and we have the Father. Think about how that fits in the pre-earth narrative. We have zoe or life, phos and light, scotia and darkness. Those words, life, light, darkness, the creation imagery, the beginning, this is all evoking this idea of the creation. And remember, the creation narrative was told at the temple. What's unspoken in this text that's not in your face is that the author is trying to invite us to consider that the God or the gods are speaking from the other side of the veil and they're telling us about the creation. And so their words are coming out of the Debir. Now in the Debir or the Holy of Holies, there's the tree, there's the ark, and there's a throne. Those three things are unspoken, but the author is assuming we know this. And in case we forget, He'll remind us at the end of the book of Revelation. He'll put those items there to remind us. I think this is what John's doing in the book of Revelation. And if John wrote the book of Revelation and John wrote this, he's doing this. He's trying to invite temple saints to consider the possibilities. And so if you go to the slide of the menorah, the title of the slide is called John's Sevenfold Witness of Christ as a Temple Theme. From verses 6 through 34, now we have John's sevenfold witness. There's a really interesting pattern here that's not found in the English, but it's found in the Greek text. We see seven times where John is a witness or a martyreon. So it starts in verse 7 of John chapter 1. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. So we got a couple of them there. Now there's seven times John's going to do this, and I think it's purposeful. That's my personal belief. The third is in the eighth verse. He was sent to bear witness of that light. The fourth is in the 15th verse where it says, John bear witness of him and cried saying, this was he of whom I spake. Okay, and then you get to the fifth reference in chapter 1, verse 19. Now, that's where it's lost in the English translation. The English says, this is the record of John. That's what it says. But it literally reads, and this is the martyria, or the witness of John. And it's translated as record, but it's a witness. And then go to verse 32. This is the sixth reference. And John bore record saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove. Well, that is literally he is witnessing or he did witness this. And then finally, the seventh reference is in verse 34. And it's in the perfect in the Greek. It says, I saw and bear record that this is the son of God. And so what we have here is a sevenfold witness. John bearing witness of a light that produces the Son of God. Another way you can read this is he bore a sevenfold witness of the Son of God that is the light of men. Now, why am I saying it that way? Well, that's why we have the menorah there in the slide. Liturgically, in the temple, in the Hakal, the big room, we have on the right, we have the bread and the wine, but on the left, we have the light. And the priest that's going to stand in that room to invite us to come unto God is this Elias priest who says, make straight the way of the Lord. He's a sevenfold witness of Jesus. He's a voice of one crying in the wilderness in the spirit of Elias. And so let's just cover some of the things he says. In verse 12, he invites us to become sons of God. He wants to give us power to do this. The word becomes tabernacled and has flesh and dwells among us. That's verse 14. John says, speaking about one coming after him, he talks about the law that was given by Moses. Now think about this. 
when he says the law was given by Moses, the priest that was in the courtyard liturgically was Moses or was typologically Moses. Why? Moses invited us out of Egypt to come to the altar of sacrifice and the labor. The articles of the temple were physical representations of the Exodus story. So the altar of sacrifice would be the sacrifice of the lamb in in Exodus 12. The laver would be Exodus 15, crossing through the sea. In fact, it's even called the sea. And then coming into the Hekal or the big house or the, the holy place is now we're in a sacred space. We've kind of ascended. We've kind of leveled up holiness. And in our context, a Latter-day Saint context, we're invited to make and keep five specific covenants that prepare us to enter into the house of the Lord. And so we have Moses who sits right in this context in verse 17 as the priest in the outer courtyard. So then what do you have in verse 18? This is where I said verse 18 earlier in the podcast could actually fit. If we have Elias in the Hakal or or the holy place, look what he says. No man has seen God. That's right, because we haven't gone through the veil yet. We haven't come into the presence of God. So verse 18 does fit in a liturgical context. Then we have him saying, I've come baptizing in verse 31. And then we have a dove descending in verse 32. We'll get back to the dove. And then in verse 34, I saw and witnessed. And then in verse 29, 36, we have John saying, behold, the Lamb of God. Then you get to this really interesting bit in the midst of this narrative, in John 1, 19-32, we're still in the Hakal or the holy place, we have John's confrontation with the antidikos, or the adversary. They say in verse 19, who are you? He says, I'm not the Christ. In verse 21, they ask him, are you Elijah? And John speaks in code. He says, yeah, I'm Elijah, but you guys don't get it. My take on this is this is the story of the confrontation with the adversary. Now, this is common in ancient Near Eastern stories where the adversary comes and he has to kind of be excused, as it were, before we can make our final ascent. Everybody in, in all the stories of the hero's journey, the hero has to go through a trial where he has this experience with the adversary. And I'm sorry, I'm just going to nerd out and talk about Star Wars. Luke has to go into the cave on Dagobah and confront this demon. He has to confront Darth Vader before he ascends. Sorry for those of you at home that are like, what is Mike talking about? Geek moment over. Now back to this, we have to get past that adversary to come into holiness, which brings us then to the initiates that are brought into the Debir by Christ. Go to verse 38. Look what they say. Where do you dwell? Pumenes. Where are you kind of resting? And he says in verse 39, come and see. And so they do in verse 39. So where are we? This is Christ liturgically inviting them into the Debir, the place of speaking. But remember, that's also the place of visions. It's the place where they're able to come into the presence of the Father and the Son. They see visions. In the Enoch literature, this is where Enoch sees the whole story of the world as he looks at the veil from God's perspective. I think this is what John's doing in the book of Revelation. So they're in the Debir, and when they come out, verse 41, Andrew says, yep, we found him. That's the Messiah. And then Andrew takes Jesus to his brother, and Simon sees him, and Simon gets a new name, Cephas, which is stone, so we have new name going on. And then Philip joins in in verse 43 through 45, and then Jesus comes to Nathanael and says, I saw you, I knew you, I perceived you under the tree, verse 48. And then in verse 45, he says, you are the son of God, you're the king. And then verse 50, because you believe, you will see greater things. And then to the audience, to you and me, all of us, the Savior says, you will see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. That is the message of John 1. This is an invitation for us to be visionaries, for us to come into the presence of God. Now, I don't want to leave one person out. We've talked about the Father. We've talked about the Son. Where's the Divine Mother? Now, this is, this is interesting, and, and this isn't for everyone. Maybe not everyone will like this, but I really like this idea. The testimony of John the Baptist is also a testimony of John the Evangelist. It can't surprise us that the evangelist writes of the mother of the Son of God in a way that's reminiscent of the temple tree of life and light and the dove. Nephi's comment about the tree is that she's, quote, precious above all. And the vision of John is that the evangelist will write, quote, 
more precious things. That's 1 Nephi 14, 23 through 24. This implicit inclusion of the virgin in the Baptist testimony is consistent with his discreet mention of her in the Holy of Holies. She isn't the focus of what he's trying to teach us, but her presence is there if we look for her. John writes of her with a light touch. So those who don't know her symbols will never even see it. But those who do know won't be able to miss her. Now that's David Butler in his book, Goodness and the Mysteries. Okay, so the question is, well, where is she? Well, I just finished this fascinating book called The Myth of the Goddess by Barry and Cashford. And in this book, they talk about in all the cultures of the ancient world, the symbol of the dove was a symbol for the Divine Mother. Another symbol for her was light, or the Shekinah, as, it, as it's often called in Jewish mystic literature. The Shekinah w- could be considered like the feminine presence of God or the dove. And so one possible way that the presence of the Heavenly Mother is present in here, in the words of Butler, with a light touch, is that image of the light and that image of the dove. And so if you read it that way, great. For me, I do. I read it that way, and I see and hear in this message an invitation for all of us to know who he is, to trust him, to receive him. And when we do, things will be made manifest, and we will see greater things than these. That, to me, is what John's doing here in John chapter 1. And so I bear witness that Joseph Smith knew this stuff. It's revealed to him, and he's, he's working in a broken language in a really difficult time in the 19th century to teach these ideas. And as I read John 1 this way, it elevates me, it builds me up, and it helps me have a greater appreciation for John, the author of this text, Joseph, the preeminent prophet of the Restoration, and the Savior, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, or as he calls himself, the Son of Man who is the son of man of holiness, of him I testify. And with that, we thank you for listening. We hope to see you again next week when we cover The Baptism of Christ, Mark 1, Matthew and Luke 3. Excellent. We'll see you next week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.